Matthew chapter 16. And this morning on this Sabbath, I believe, my friends, that we're going to be challenged. But that's okay, because the only way our faith in Christ can increase is as we go through challenges. Matthew chapter 16, the Bible says, beginning with verse number 13. Are we there, my friends? Are we there? The Bible says in verse 13, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Let's pause right there, my friends. So what was a general question that Christ posed to, to these disciples? Amen. So what is the consensus in the marketplace of who I am? What do the church leaders and even the church members, what do they say? Who do they say that I am? And what was the response of the disciples to Christ? Some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah. Still others say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets was Christ Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah? No, friends. So what is the implication here? You need to watch this. What is the implication here? The amen. The majority of the Jewish leaders did not know who Jesus Christ was. That's startling, right? And even the members who were under their tutelage, they themselves did not know who Jesus Christ was. That's starting, right? And friends, it's nothing new because when you look at the life and experience of a man called Nicodemus, what was Nicodemus' title? He was a rabbi, a teacher in Israel. Nevertheless, in John chapter 3, what did Christ say to Nicodemus? Huh? How could you be a teacher in Israel? and not know the principles of conversion, of how to be born again. It's nothing new, my friend. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They did not know. And one of the greatest reasons why the majority of the Jewish leaders and the people did not know who Christ was, it was because they had rejected the prophecies of the Old Testament. They had refused to accept the true interpretation of Bible prophecy. They had placed man-made traditions above the word of Jesus Christ. Man-made interpretation of prophecy above the interpretation of the Holy Spirit. As a result, the majority of these church leaders and the people who were in those synagogues did not know who Jesus Christ was. And the sad truth is, my friends, as it was then, so it is today. And notice now in Matthew 16, Christ now moved himself from asking a general question about who men say that I am, and now Christ came to a personal application. Who do you say that I am? You see, friends, it's one thing for us to realize that the majority of professed Christian leaders and people, the majority now, are in apostasy. They don't understand and don't care to understand Bible truth. That's one thing, but the great question is, do you have a spiritual experience with Christ. Look with me at Matthew 16. Verse number 15, Jesus says now, He saith unto them, But whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of whom? The Son of the living God. Question. How many times have we heard that text quoted? Many times, right? 
Okay, you're not with me. Okay, friends, we're in class. It's a sermon, right? But we're in class. Every moment when the word is preached, we must use that moment as a teaching moment. All right? And when you're in class, when the instructor asks a question, what does he expect? All right, and as we, as we reason together in the scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, it's more difficult for us to lose focus and to go to sleep. Are we together now? Are we together now, friends? So now we have to go beyond the surface here. Whom do you say I am? And what was the response? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Have you ever pondered? Why did Peter respond by saying, you are the Christ? What does the word Christ mean anyway? The anointed one. Anyone else? Christ. Oh, friends, that's why we need to understand this. Go to John chapter 1 with me. John chapter 1. Hold your finger on Matthew chapter 16. Go with me to John chapter 1. We don't need this whole shouting and carrying on. We need to educate the people in spiritual lines. Because, friends, except we understand the truths of God intellectually, it's very difficult for us then to be settled into that truth intellectually and spiritually so that we will not be moved. Moved by what? By damnable heresies. John chapter 1. Are we there, my friends? Thou art the what? The Christ. The son of the whom? The living God. Did you know the word Christ means Messiah? Right now, this might sound as if, so what, pastor? You're going to see how deep this point is. John chapter 1, verse 41. Are we there? The Bible says, Andrew found his brother Simon Peter and called him to come and meet Christ. And verse 41 now says, he first finds his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the whom? We have found the Messiah, or Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So what does Christ mean? The Messiah, go with me to John chapter 4, because friends, as Bible-believing Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we know we never use one scripture to prove any doctrine, amen? amen. Look with me at John chapter 4. We're going to come back to Matthew chapter 16. Hold your finger there. Look with me now at John chapter 4. One more scripture to prove Christ means Messiah. Verse 25 of John chapter 4. The Bible says, the woman, this is the woman at the well. It's so sad, my friends, that Christ was able to reveal himself to a quote and quote heathen woman. It's in quotes now. Here is a woman that was not a Jew by birth, but she was in such a humble and teachable condition that to her, Christ could reveal himself. However, on the flip side, John chapter 1 verse 11 says, He came unto his own. And his own received him how? Not as it was then, so shall it be today. John chapter 4 verse 25. We need to humble ourselves, my friends, and not boast ourselves. We are seven-day advent. We need to humble ourselves. John chapter 4, verse 25, are we there? The Bible says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, or the Messiah will come, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Question, my friends, so what does the word Christ mean? It means Messiah, the Messiah to come. So now let's couple these points together now. Whom do you say I am? And what was Peter's response? Thou art the Christ or thou art the promised Messiah, the Messiah to come, the Messiah to come. Oh, friends, I got thinking on this point here. And I want you all to think. You should never just be mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. I need you all to think. Question, where did Peter get that term from? You are the Christ, which means you are the promised Messiah. Where did he get that thought from? 
Huh? It's the prophecies. And friends, question, when Christ walked this earth, was there a written New Testament? There was no New Testament from Matthew to Revelation, no such thing. All they had were what? The Old Testament books. Question now, so where in the Old Testament do we find the word Messiah? Okay. Okay, let's learn now. Hold your finger in Matthew 16. Because, friends, when you see this, you will see why I have to gradually lead you along, not running ahead of you, because I want us to walk together. You need to understand this, that there's only one place. How many places? There's only one scripture in all of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. There's only one. Scripture where you will find the word Messiah. And it's written only, guess which book? In the book of Daniel chapter 9. I wonder why. Hold your finger in Matthew chapter 16, Daniel chapter 9. Let's go there, friends. Where are we going to? Daniel chapter 9. If you take up your Bible's concordance and look up the word Messiah, it's only written once in a scripture, and in that chapter, Daniel chapter 9, it's only there two times. No other scripture, no other chapter, in no other book, only in Daniel chapter 9. Look at verse 24 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. The Bible says, follow me now. The Bible says uh, in verse 24, 70 weeks. How many weeks? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of what? Sins. Question now, friends. Look at verse 25. What word do you find in verse 25 that we are talking about? What word is in verse 25? Messiah. Look in verse 26, what word is in, oh friend, you see, I want your brains to work, amen. Look in verse 26, what word again do we find in verse 26? That is a theme of our subject. Messiah, my own, this is the only place where you find the word Messiah. And question, which prophecy is the Messiah connected to? The, the 70 weeks prophecy, oh my friends. A question now what was one of the primary reasons why the majority of the Jewish leaders and the people did not know who Christ was do you see it now does it make sense to you now friends they had rejected they had neglected to study diligently the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 do you see it now? Okay, shall we make the application now, friends? You ready for it? Okay, friends, which prophecy is the, look at the screen, is the 70 weeks prophecy, the 490 literal years, which bigger prophecy, which larger prophecy is the, may I finish? Which larger prophecy is the 70 weeks a part of, come on now, the 23 hundred days prophecy or the 2300 literal years that we find in what scripture Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 so what now is the application hold on there when did the 2300 days prophecy begin 457 BC and when did it come to an end in which year 18 44, and which work did Jesus begin October 22, 1844? The work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, the work of investigative judgment. And friends, which movement, hold on now, which movement did Christ raise up in 1844 to live and to teach this message? Only one movement. It is the Seventh-day Adventist movement, my friends. So watch. Why is it that the majority, underscore, 
Why is it the majority of church leaders, Seventh-day Adventist leaders, teachers, and preachers, and people are in apostasy? Why, my friends? Why is it that the majority of them, two things, do not know and believe in Christ's position? And Christ's work in the heaven. Why? They have rejected the 2300 years prophecy, days prophecy. They have rejected the true understanding of the 2300 days of prophecy. And that's why, friends, it's so easy for a Seventh-day Adventist leader to go out reaching over the abyss to clasp hand with popery. Reaching over the gulf to clasp hand with a minister from Babylon. It's so easy now, friends, for them to bring in books from infidel authors. So easy now. Do you see why? It's so easy now, friends, for them now to bring in the worldly musicians from Babylon into the church. So easy now because, friends, it's so sad. We as a people, no longer do we know who we are. We no longer know what our mission is. We are a peculiar people. That's us, my friends. And not to pat ourselves on our but my friends. It is to ask God to give us more than just a name, but to give us a true spiritual connection with him before it is too late. We have rejected this prophecy. Now, maybe you think I'm just guessing at this, or it's my own opinion. If you go back into the 1950s, there was a book that came out that was called Seventh-day Adventists Answer Questions on Doctrine. In that book, Martin Barnhouse and the general conference leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination put out this book. And they said, we no longer believe in the sanctuary. They said what Christ is doing in the sanctuary as pictured in the book of Hebrews and Daniel and the Revelation, it is just figurative. Get that book called Letters to the Churches by M. L. Andreessen. It's in black and white, my friends. Now, some leaders may say, we still believe in the sanctuary, but the majority have rejected it. Let's move on from 1950s. Look now, friends. In the year, in the 1970s, into the, the early 1980s, there was a controversial and influential pastor by the name of Desmond Ford. Very influential. And he preached and taught and wrote books and denied and rejected the 2300 days prophecy. Oh, friends, he has rejected the sanctuary and the investigative judgment. Are you hearing me? Friends, are you hearing me? Hear me carefully now. The pioneer view of the 2300 days prophecy from Sister White, James White, Hiram Edson, A.T. Jones, Wagner of Wagner, all these men, the pioneer view, Lothboro, are pioneers. Oh, friends, the Bible's view has been rejected by Desmond Ford. And friends, the church, this denomination, I read, they took away his uh, license to preach and so on and so forth. Hear me carefully now. But Desmond Ford is still preaching in the churches. Do you know how? You know how? One, through the books he has written. The ministers, listen friends, he taught in the major schools of theology within this denomination. From Australia to America. The major schools and all those, hear me, all those students who sat under Desmond Ford drinking from broken cisterns. 
Those preachers, those leaders are now the ones who are the movers and the shakers in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. They are the ones. They are the ones. He is still preaching in the pulpits all throughout Seventh-day Adventism, not directly now, but indirectly through the scholars he taught. The students he taught and the ministers that he counseled, I heard he said once, don't leave with me. Don't leave the church. Just stay in the church. Stay right there. Don't, don't, don't do anything to lose your credentials. Stay right there. And keep teaching these policies. And friends, may I give you a testimony? Friends, when I attended Oakwood University, in the School of Theology, I sat in two classes dealing with theology. One was on the book of Hebrews and the other on the book of Revelation. And two prominent, influential professors told the whole class, just picture a class of young, impressionable minds. And those two men said that there's no such thing as a heavenly sanctuary. And one of, and if I say this now, some of my peers from back in the day would know exactly who I'm talking about. One of them once said, my friend, no, no, one of them now is steeped into spiritualism. He loves his Bob Marley reggae music, and he's still a Seventh-day Adventist professor. That's what, that's what he's into. And the second professor said, oh, first, listen to what he said. He said, hear me carefully, he said that there is a heavenly sanctuary and Christ is now doing an investigative judgment. He said, that idea, I quote, it is a hogwash. Hogwash, that's what he said. And that's why we have these young ministers now who are taking over the large metropolitan churches in the U.S. and around the world. And what are they teaching? The principles of the new theology. It's a false revival. It is spiritualism, my friends. You expect Andrew Henriquez to keep silent? Why there are wolves in sheep clothing? How do you think Christ feels? How do you think Christ feels? Forget about how we feel. How do you think Jesus feels? Look at the statement here, friends, on the screen. The Great Controversy, page 409 says, The scripture, let's read. The scripture which above all others had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days. Oh, friends, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Question now. So what is the scripture that is both our foundation and our pillar, the central pillar of the Seventh-day Adventist movement? What is that scripture? Oh, friends, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, the 2300 days prophecy. So if men have rejected that prophecy, are they standing on the shore? Firm foundation. They're not, my friends. They're not. I must tell you the truth. It may hurt. It may agitate you, but the truth is still the truth, my friends. Listen to what this says. So now, and the seven weeks prophecy was a part of which larger prophecy? Oh, for, that's why the Jewish leaders did not know who Jesus was. They had left which foundation? They had left the foundation of Jesus Christ. Look now, friends, the book Early Writings, page 63 says, There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is a present truth. What is present truth? It's a term being thrown around today. Hear what it says, but it is what? Present truth. That the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important 
points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Question, pause. So there are messages that God has sent to us that the objective of these messages is to unite the flock. Amen. So friends, if we preach and teach any subject and leave out these principal subjects, those messages, those books, those sermons would never do what? Unite the flock. They will never sanctify the soul. Hold on. Do you mean this message can fix broken marriages? Do you mean these messages with the right interpretation can also bring unity in the local churches? It says uh, Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause but such subjects as uh, the sanctuary in connection with what friends uh, the 2300 days uh, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past advent movement and show what our present position is uh, establish the faith uh, of the doubting and to give certainty to the glorious future. Then we are told, my friends, these I have frequently seen were the principal subjects upon which who should dwell? Who should dwell? So my friends, we need to write our local pastors, elders, or oh, oh, be careful, pastor. Even the teachers, oh, why not dwell? Why are you not dwelling upon these messages? And if they refuse, find another local church. Because there you will never be united to Jesus. And in turn, be one with each other. You will never ever be sanctified. Is that clear, my friends? So now today, March 29, March the 29th, 2014, are we receiving the present truth? Amen. The Great Controversy Page 488 says, uh, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. How many friends? Listen now. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Pause right there. How many need this understanding? Does this include young people? Yes. What is Christ's position? High priest before the throne of God. And what is his work? Not just to intercede, but to, but to, but to blot out sins. Oh, friends, think about that. How would you apply that to your life? It says now, otherwise, it will be what? impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case, my friends. Let's pause there. Each has a what? A case pending at the bar of God each must meet the judge how face to face. And what song did my wife just sing, my friends? And I shall see him how face to face. Oh, my friends, this is the message to prepare us for the close of the investigative judgment and the second coming of Jesus Christ. If that's clear, say amen. amen. So now, friends, is this our foundation? Yes. And once Peter said, listen carefully, once Peter confessed Jesus as the promised Christ, as the promised Messiah, then Christ said now to Peter and to the others upon this rock, I will build my 
church. Upon what, my friends? Upon this uh, rock, I will build my church. Friends, you need to follow me. And the gates of hell shall never, ever prevail against it. Question, is the rock Peter? Again, is the rock Peter? So who is the rock? Okay, now you said Christ is the rock. Give me a text for that. All right, let's study. Ready? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hold your finger on Matthew chapter 16. Because, friends, we need to understand this because the majority of professed Christians in the world believe that Peter is the rock. Thank you, Elder. Peter means pebble, not a boulder, not a rock, my friends. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Are we there, my friends? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is the rock. Verse 4, are we there, my friends? Are we there? The Bible says now in verse 4, and did all what? And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they what? Drank of that spiritual what? Rock that followed them. And that rock was who? That rock was Christ, question now. And what does Christ mean? Messiah. The rock was the Messiah, my friends. So question, upon what, pardon me, pardon me, upon whom is the church built? Upon Christ, question now, what has Christ, what does Christ give to us so that we can know he is the Messiah? What is it? What? Somebody has been listening. It is prophecy. Why did the Jewish leaders not know who he was? What did they reject? Go to John chapter 13. Prophecy, my friends. John chapter 13. Where are we going to, my friends? John chapter 13, preacher. John chapter 13. Where are we going to, friends? John chapter 13. It's cold. Amen. We don't want that. We want to be hot for Jesus. John chapter 13. Look with me at verse number 19. Are we there, my friends? The Bible says in verse 19, together. Now, I tell you, before it come, that when it is come to pass, you might what? Believe that I am he. Question. So what does Jesus give to us so that we can have certainty he is the Messiah? Prophecy. I tell you before, I'm going to foretell you something. So my friends, upon what rock then is the church built? What two things? It's upon the prophecies, the true understanding of prophecy. And Jesus Christ, let's make sense now of this. Christ is the rock. And what does he give us so we can know he is the rock? He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Prophecy. So what is the church built on? Prophecy, friends. The prophecy of Jesus Christ. That means the Seventh-day Adventist movement and denomination is a prophetic movement. Would you say amen? amen? And if Satan wants to destroy our identity, all he has to do is to bring men in who were taught by Jesuits to change the interpretation of prophecy. And then the church no longer knows who they are. And what their mission is, go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Where are we going to, my friends? Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible tells us now concerning what Christ said in Matthew chapter 16 upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall what? Not prevail against it. Notice now, my friends, upon this rock I what? Build. Look with me now. Ephesians chapter 2, are we there, my friends? Verse 19 says, uh, verse 19, Now therefore, you are no more strangers, let's read, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household 
of God. May I ask you a question now? What is a synonymous word to the household of God? The house, of, it's the church. Look at verse 20 now. Upon what is the church built? Verse 20 now together and are. Ah, do you see it, friends? Do you see that? Verse 20 once more. And are built upon the foundation of whom? The apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief. Cornerstone, again I ask you, what is the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination? Church and denomination, what should be our foundation? The prophecies of Jesus Christ, they must be merged together. Notice what this statement says. Go back to Matthew 16 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Matthew chapter 16. Look at the screen here, friends. Gospel Workers, page 148. Ready? It says, everyone together, ministers should present what? The sure word of prophecy as the what, friends? Pause right there. I love when the Bible and the spirit of prophecy just, they just merge and blend together. One more time. It says what, friends? Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied. In connection with them, which word? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the what? The sins of of the world, the sin of the world. This is talking about the blotting out of sins when he takes sins away. Daniel and the Revelation. Matthew chapter 16 now, friends. May I ask you a question? Did Christ give some people some symbolic keys? Don't look strange on me, friends. Matthew 16 is familiar to many of us. Come on. Did Christ say, I'll give you some keys? Yes. I wonder, who did he give the keys to? Peter. Oh, boy. Not, not only Peter, <laughs> but to the disciples. All right, amen. Question, did he give it to men who did not know who he was? And why did they not know who he was? They had rejected the foundation of their movement. So question, the men today who have rejected these prophecies, oh friends, and the kindred prophecies that are linked to the 2300 days prophecy, do they have the keys from Jesus Christ? Don't have it. Matthew 16. So friends, okay, we know it. So what are the keys symbolic to? Huh? The keys represent what? The word of God. Because, friends, only as we receive wholeheartedly the word of God that heaven is open to us. And as we reject the words of God, then what, my friends? Heaven is closed to us. Luke chapter 11. Hold Matthew 16. Luke what chapter? Luke chapter 11. Notice with me, my friends, in Luke chapter 11. Beloved, now we need to understand this, friends. Save to serve church. Hear me carefully. If we love truth, if we really want to be saved by Jesus Christ, guess what? He has given to all of us the symbolic keys. And how dare we hide these keys? How dare we keep the gospel keys to ourselves? Let's use these keys to further God's work. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 11 verse 52 confirms the keys represent the knowledge of the gospel. Ready, friends? Verse 52 says, Woe unto you whom? Lawyers. These were the churchmen. Woe unto you, lawyers. For you have taken away what? The key of what? Knowledge. Do you see it now? The key of knowledge, you entered not in yourselves, not in yourselves, and them that are entering in, you hindered. 
Do you see it now, friends? Matthew chapter 16. Oh, friends, I want you to catch this point now. Question, friends, did Christ begin to share with his disciples of a coming crisis? Did he? Yes. But I want you to see at which point Jesus began to share with his disciples about a coming crisis. Question, what was that crisis? His crucifixion. And which two entities would unite falsely to crucify him? Church and what? State question, my friends. Has Christ given to us a message concerning a false union of a church and state to persecute and kill his true saints in these last days? Do we have such a message? Again, do we have such a message? Yes. But unless we are willing to study prophecies diligently and to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing about the mark of the beast and the national son law will be of no benefit to us. Matthew chapter 16. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, I'm going to show you a key here. Whenever you read scripture, take your time. If you read the word slowly, the Holy Spirit will begin to connect some dots for you so that you can then see the big picture of why certain things were said at certain times. Are we together now? Look at Matthew 16, verse 21. Are we there? The Bible says, what are the first four words? From what time forth? From that time forth, what came, what was, what came before this? Whom do you say that I am? Do you see it? Do you know who I am? So now once these, these disciples were willing to understand Bible prophecies, are we together? And to have a close relationship with Jesus Christ from that time, Forth. Read on. Began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again when the third day from what time forth? Not until these disciples, hear me carefully, not until these disciples understood who Christ was. They were willing to study what, friends? Bible, prophecies, and to have what? A personal relationship abiding in Christ. At that time now, Christ began to say, the crisis is coming. Let's make the application. You see, friends, if people both in our homes, if people, even those who attend this church, and those in the world, if they do not have, if they do not have a desire to study Bible prophecy, hear me carefully. If they are not seeking to abide in Christ, you telling them about the union of church and state to persecute God's people will profit them nothing. Or together, my friends, it will profit them what? Nothing. Because unless you are abiding in Christ and have that desire, you would never be able to go through the mark of the beast crisis. And friends, when Christ said, church and state will persecute me, kill me, what was Peter's response? Be it far from thee, Lord. This will what? Never. Never happen. Be far from thee. I wonder, friends, think for me. Think for me. Why do you think Peter said those words? No, Lord. No, Lord. Why do you think he said those words? Huh? Not only that he didn't understand, but Peter read his own demise. Do you see it now? His own fate. His own persecution. Because if Jesus just said, 
church and state will unite to kill me. And Peter is saying, but I'm following you. Do you see it now? Do you see it now, friends? So your persecution, what you experience, uh, I will also experience. At this moment, Peter was fearful. That's one side of it. Very fearful. But my friends, what does 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says? For God hath not given to us. Come on, we know it. For God has not given to us what? The spirit of fear. But of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So friends, since God did not give Peter that spirit of fear, who gave it to him? And who possessed him in Matthew 16, verse 23? Let's read that. Matthew 16, verse, are we there? The Bible says in verse 23, But he turned and said unto Peter, what friends? Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest, thou desirest not the things that be of God, but those but those that be of men. I wonder what the application could be, friends. How could it be that Peter, a few moments ago, was just being inspired by the Holy Spirit? Flesh and blood, Peter, did not reveal this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And the next moment, who possessed Peter? Do you see why, friends, at no time we should ever think that our feet cannot slip? At no time. Let's move on. What application can we make of this? Hear me, friends. Peter had an intellectual understanding of prophecy to some extent. Hear me now. But he refused to accept the application to himself. Just like today, all of us, how many of us believe that we're living in the last days? Raise your hand. Hands down. How many of us believe that this past Thursday, when the president of America, Barack Obama, met with Pope Francis, that that meeting is one more step to finally fulfill, completely fulfill the mark of the beast crisis? How many of us believe that? Raise your hand. Then, my friends, notice now, are you like Peter? You can intellectually say, yes, we are living in the last days. Yes, prophecy is being fulfilled. Yet some of us reject the application that we individually will have to suffer for Jesus Christ. Revelation 13. Where are we going to, my friends? Revelation chapter 13, and look with me, my friends, in verse number 15. Revelation chapter 13, and verse number 15, friends, listen to me carefully. I want to prepare you for something. Let's read verse 15 together. And I want us to see this message as a connecting message to all the previous ones we have heard. Amen? Look at verse 15 with me. Are we there? What it says, friends, together. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be what? Killed is persecution coming for God's people in these last days. And friends, is it going to be serious? Go to 1 John chapter 4 with me. 1 John chapter 4. Is it going to be serious, my friends? Yes. Beloved, I was tempted to put on your sermon notes, to put on your sermon notes, a history of, of Huss and Jerome. Do you know what they did to Jerome, friends? Do you know what they did to John Huss? They tied him up to a pole and put faggots under his feet and light fire on a living, breathing person, and John Huss burned from his feet to his skull, all because he stood for Jesus Christ and his truth. 
and he stood in love, my friends. But persecution came. As it was then, so shall it be in these last days, friends. It is coming again. And naturally, right now, friends, we aren't ready for this. You know that? We aren't ready, friends. But look at verse 18 with me. We don't need to fear what's coming. Amen, friends? Oh, boy. Friends, look at me. We don't need to fear what's coming. Once we are abiding in Christ, he will be a shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock in a weary land, cooling shade on the burning sand, faithful guide on the what, friends? On this pilgrim band. He's a shelter. And he will be a shelter in the time of what? Storm. But listen, if Christ chooses for us to be martyrs, guess what he will give us? He will give us the strength to be what? A martyr for him. Don't fear. First John chapter 4. Are we there, my friends? Verse 18 says, are we there? Yes. Beloved, many people have cancer because fear has overtaken them. Many people are sick today because they are stressed. And as a minister, as a mi I have to be very careful how I emphasize these truths, lest you become stressed, depressed, discouraged. Are we together? Look with me at verse 18. Friends, it must be a two-sided message. Are we there? Verse 18 says, there is no, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out what, friends? Fear. Because fear hath what? Torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Should we fear, my friends? But listen now, listen now. What did these men say? Who did these men say Christ was? Matthew 16. Not, not these disciples now, but the majority of those leaders. Who did they say Christ was? Wrongfully? Who? The wrong answer. Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Others say you are Jeremiah. Hold on there, friends. I want to prepare you for what is coming. Hear me carefully. Father in heaven, speak to, the, speak to us now clearly. Speak to us now specifically that we might be ready for these last days. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, question. What did they do? What did the union of church and state do to John the Baptist? Could you please talk to me? Do you believe it, my friend? They threw John where? In prison? And who asked for the head of John the Baptist? Huh? Herodias? Church power. And who did she unite with? Herod? Herod. Herod. Church and what? Herod, king of the Jews. Church and state shop beheaded John the Baptist. And friends, what was John's warning to Herod? Le huh? Leave Philip's wife alone. In other words, you are in an adulterous relationship. And friends, has God given to us such a similar message? Huh, friends? It's a question. So what will happen to us like John the Baptist? So my friends, if Christ were to tell you, to tell us right now, that you will die a similar death as did John the Baptist, would you still serve Jesus? Would you still live, oh friends, would you still choose underscore choose would you still choose to serve Jesus would you still choose my friend oh beloved is it serious is there a crisis coming hear me carefully I, I read on Huffington Post which is a news media outlet Huffington Post 
that they asked the former vice president of America, Dick Cheney, what would you have done if you had the opportunity to, 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 to do again? What would you have done? Especially with, especially with torture and waterboarding. Do you know what he said? I would have done the same thing all over again. All these elements of torture, they are putting in place and they are saying it, these things are for terrorists. Do you not know? We are going to be called and labeled terrorists because we stand for Jesus Christ. Do you know what they said of Christ, my friends? In Luke 23, verse 1 and verse 2, this man is perverting the nation. Christ was labeled a terrorist. My friends, let's talk about Elijah. What did they do to Elijah? Did Ahab say, go and search every nation, every kingdom. If you find Elijah, kill him. Did they put a price on the head of Elijah? They said, my friends, in so many words, dead or alive, bring him back here. Oh, friends, I want to ask you a question. If you knew that you were going to be hated by all nations, of all nations, would you still choose to live for Jesus? Would you still, my friends? Would you still choose? And what did Obadiah say to Elijah concerning the prophets? Obadiah said, I hid the prophets by 50 weir. In a cave, why was Obadiah hiding those prophets? There was a crisis to kill the prophets. Would you still choose to serve Jesus? Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Others say you are Jeremiah. Question, what did they do to Jeremiah? Friends, do you know? Okay. They put Jeremiah... In a deep, deep dungeon. A dungeon filled with mire. Sinking sand, my friends. Hear me carefully. For many days. And think about how gross it was. Where do you think he defecated? Where do you think he passed his stool? Where do you think he urinated, my friend? Where? And where do you think he slept? If he slept. Where do you think my it Right there. In that same condition. And you think it's going to get better. Hear me. Second Timothy. Chapter 3 verse 13 says. For evil men and seducers. Shall wax good and good. Right? Shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. Are men getting more holier today? No my friends. They are waxing worse and worse. Friends, if you knew that you were to suffer like Jeremiah because you stand for the Sabbath, because you profess to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, because you do not believe in a false union of church and state, and you were told your fate is going to be just like Jeremiah. Have you read about what happened in Cuba? Oh boy, the prison cells in Cuba, where they brought the, where they brought the so-called terrorists to. Hmm? What horrible thing they went through, friends. It's going to get worse. Would you still choose to follow Jesus? You see, friends, I read something in the spirit of prophecy. Hear me carefully. I don't want to bark at you. I want you to hear a still small voice. Hear me carefully. We are told we have actors who display a written script. The actors, they preach, pardon me, they act out things which are unreal as if they are real. But ministers of God, here it is now, they preach about real things as if they are unreal. 
Friends, it's going to get worse. And the question is, would you still choose to follow Jesus? Friends, I am preparing you for the coming crisis. And what encouraged Paul? Did Paul suffer persecution, my friends? And what encouraged Paul to remain faithful to Jesus Christ still, even though he went through fiery trials, fiery tribulations, my friends, it was to see that Jesus went through the same things for him. That's why we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's quote Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Let's quote it. It's Paul's experience. It says, for I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Who what, my friends? Again, who what? Who loved me and who loves me and gave himself for me. So now Paul is saying, oh friends, catch it. Paul is saying, since Jesus loves me and gave him, come on, talk to me, and gave him self for me, today I am willing to be what? Huh? I am willing to be what? Crucified with him, for him. Why? He loves me and gave himself for me. The songwriter says, Jesus says, I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed that thou might ransomed be and risen from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Oh, friends, the third stanza says, I suffered, it's Christ speaking to all of us, I suffered much for thee. Listen, more than your tongue can tell of bitterest agony. For what purpose, Jesus? To rescue you from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. Hast thou borne aught for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. Hast thou borne aught for me? John 21. Let's go there, my friends. Where are we going to? Beloved, I am preparing us for the coming crisis. I'm coming to a close shortly. But my friends, I am preparing us for the coming crisis. Parents, may I talk to you for a minute here? I'm going to encourage all of you parents to go back and read a chapter in the great controversy called the war dances. The war dances. And see what those parents, how those parents trained their children. And what they were training them for. And this is why the devil hates the book, The Great Controversy. It's complete. Amen. Notice, my friends, John 21. Are we there? Amen. Friends, did Christ tell Peter what his demise would be? Did Christ tell Peter how he would die? And what did he say to Peter? Look at John 21. Are we there, friends? Verse 18, are we there? The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, when thou wast, who is Christ talking to? Peter, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkst whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth up thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Question, how were they about to kill Peter? How? They were about to crucify him. 
Did Christ tell Peter how he would die? And friends, when we read the history of the martyrs, the history of these apostles, even Christ, we are reading what would take place when in these last days. And friends, what did Peter request? Don't crucify me upward. Crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. And notice, when Christ told Peter what was coming to him, listen to what Christ told him afterwards. Verse number 19, are we there? Everyone together what it says, friends. This spake he, signifying by what death he should what? Glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him what? Follow me, O oh my friends. Christ just told Peter what? Oh, friends, could you talk to me? Christ just told Peter what? You're going to die. And how you're going to die? Your freedom will be taken away, Peter. Do you see that? When you were young, you could move about. But a point is going to come. Your freedom will be what? Do we have such a message? Yes. yes. And what did Christ say to Peter? Nevertheless, what? Follow me. Oh, friends, will we say like that songwriter, I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoever my lot may be. Oh, my friends, where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I will follow me. I will follow thee. And one stanza says, though the road, oh, friends, is Christ talking to us today. Listen, the songwriter says, Though the road be rough and thorny, trackless as a foaming sea, but thou hast trod this way before me, and I will what? Gladly follow thee. Oh, my friends, though we meet through tribulation, Sorely tempted though I be, I remember thou was tempted, and I rejoice to follow thee. Hear what this statement says, my friends, as we bring this to a close. The Great Controversy, page 608. Let's read, my friends, what it says. In this time, in this time of persecution, the faith of the Lord's servants will be what? tried. Oh, friends, hear me, hear me. Let me just paraphrase this statement because your brain cannot take any more. I see it. But friends, we are told, right now we have so much energy to preach the truth. We are so excited to go and knock on doors to share the gospel with people. But a day is going to come when the persecution gets so fiery that the majority of God's faithful people will say, let's read now, right here. Yet, come on. Yet when the storm of opposition and reproach bursts upon them, some overwhelmed with consternation will be ready to exclaim, had we foreseen the consequences of our words, we would have held our peace. That's serious. Some of us are going to say, if I had really known by experience the bitter persecution, I would not have joined the Seventh Day Adventist faith. It is coming. If I had known, now many of them knew it by theory. But when the storm of opposition bursts upon them, many are going to say, I wished I never accepted the Sabbath. Friends, when I read that, my wife can tell you, and Christian, we were in devotion, and tears were in my eyes. I said, honey, how can we see what is coming and not 
prepare the people of God. It is not going to be, pardon, pardon my proverb, it is not going to be a bed of roses. It is not going to be that, my friends. It's, my friends, the path to heaven must go through Gethsemane. Are you hearing me? That's the path Christ trod. Hear me, friends. The path to heaven must go through Pilate's judgment hall. Hear me once more. The path to glory must go through Calvary's cross. Did Peter deny his Lord? Oh, my friends. But what did he say a few moments before? I would never forsake you, Lord. I would never forsake you, Lord. But friends, when the storm burst upon Peter, do you see it now, friends? Do you see it? And all those other 10 disciples, they what? They took off, ran away. And I believe they said, if we knew it would have been like this, we would never have joined the band of Jesus Christ. It's going to be terrible, friends. Sorry if I'm scaring you. But my friends, it is the truth. Amen. Now, do you know why you can get this and understand this? Because when did Jesus shear what was coming? When? He asked him what first? Who do not man, who do you say that I am? You see, once they said, we believe who you are, we know who you are, then I must share this with you. I would not be a faithful father, a faithful God, a faithful shepherd if I withhold this. So friends, how many of you believe in Jesus? Raise your hand. How many of you believe in the prophecies? Raise your hand. Then my friends, I have to share this with you. Now, as I close, hear me carefully, as I close, just before the cross, before when, friends? Just before the cross, the Roman yoke, what yoke? Friends, I could see your brains right now. I could see your cups. It's almost full. But friends, I cannot close this message without giving you this point. All right? Just before the cross, hear me carefully, just before the cross, we are told the Roman yoke, what yoke? The Romans, the Romans, they placed a heavy burden upon the people. And it was an economic burden. A what, friends? It was a financial burden. And guess what the devil did? He caused the people, Christ professed people now, to be focusing just on how to get deliverance from under the yoke of Rome, under the financial oppression of Rome. And they were so focused just on how am I going to pay the bills? Where will I work tomorrow? And they had no time to watch the closing scenes of prophecy. And when Jesus died upon the cross, we are told they were on ready for the crisis. Listen, friends. So what is the application? Don't just say same thing. What's the application, friends? What's going on since 2001, September 11, since 2008, the great financial recession? What is going on now, friends? It's a financial crunch. Do you see it now? And we are the majority of God's professed people's minds. How am I going to take care of my temporal needs? And friends, they pay no attention to the events that are fast fulfilling around them. And we are told the time of trouble will catch them unready. May I read this in close? Hear what it says, friends. It's serious. I can't close without this. If I see a sneer, I must tell you, watch out. Amen? Amen. Jesus says, seek me first. And my... And all these things shall be what? Thank you for filling in the blanks. Amen? Hear what this says. Great controversy. 
page 594 says, listen, before his crucifixion, the Savior explained to his disciples that he was to be what? Put to death and to rise again from the tomb. And who were present? And angels were present to impress his words on minds and hearts. But the disciples, the who friends? Were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke. And they could not tolerate the thought that he in whom all their hopes centered should suffer an anonymous, an anonymous death, such horrible death. Pause there, my friends. In other words, they said, we don't want to hear about any prophecy. They could not tolerate the thought of a coming crisis. We don't want to hear about church and state. Guess what? Just all we want is what? Deliverance in our temporal sphere of life. Does this sound like many profess Seventh-day Adventists today? And those in the world, my friends. Yes. Listen now. Listen, listen. Do you see why I could not close without this? It says, let's read. The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds. And when the time of trial came, the cross, it found them unprepared. Listen now. The death of Jesus has fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not forewarned them so in the prophecies. Oh, friends, do you see that? So now the application is being made. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was opened to whom? The disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. This could take one sermon by itself. It says now, Satan does what? He watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation. And the time of trouble will find them already. Pope Francis, Obama, they all said, we agree on economics. The Roman yoke is here, my friends. And here we are, just focusing on our temporal sphere, while the events that are connected with the clothes of probation are all around us, and we are unready. Did Sister White say, just before the clothes of probation, God showed me, God showed me, every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be drums, music, dancing, and shouting in the church, the senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. She said, God showed her this would take place just before the close of probation. Are we here, my friends? So Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Even the thunder just rolled, my friends. And when Christ stands up and he says, it is done, my friends, thunder will roll again. But this time, some will hear the voice of Jesus while the majority will just hear thunder. So my friends, today we want to make our calling and our election sure that when Jesus says, come home, 
If you have to go to sleep before he comes, you will die in Christ. Would you say amen, friends? Amen. And if you're alive when he comes, when he speaks, you will hear the voice of your sweet Jesus. Oh, friends, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Ah, oh, friends, think about this as you're praying. What will you give for the exchange of your soul? A man called Esau, he gave a up his birthright for food and that's what many of us are doing we are giving up salvation just to get temporal necessities what shall a man give in exchange for his soul there was a man called Balaam he gave up salvation just to receive honor from Balak oh my friends how did you live this past week you can leave your justified but you have to see Jesus you have to ask him, Lord, show me my sins. Show me my weaknesses and give me power over them. Dear God, cleanse me, cleanse me, cleanse me. Father in heaven, we believe we heard your voice today. And we respond, by your grace, we will follow thee. Hear the prayers of your people who are now praying. And together we all say, Lord, we see what is coming. But by your grace, we choose to follow thee. And we believe you will strengthen us. Today, we make the right exchange. We give you our sins and we accept your pardon. We accept your forgiveness. We accept justification. And we accept your power to live a sanctified life. Save us is our prayer. Please, Lord, help us to trust you to take care of our temporal needs and give you our hearts fully, is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And friends, is there one who says, Lord, I give you my heart today. Why not raise your hand for Jesus?